Hello and welcome to this part of my BGE Basics tutorial series. In this tutorial I'm going to go pretty in-depth on the logic editor and explain how everything inside of it works, especially the logic bricks. And at the end of the tutorial I'm going to do a little demonstration with you to show you how to put what you learned to use. And now with all that out of the way, let's jump into it. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is open up our logic editor. So I'm going to come down here and expand the timeline and then turn it into the logic editor here. And in the logic editor we have sensors, controllers, actuators, and game properties. Now each one of these serves its own purpose and the first thing I'm going to go over is the sensor. So let's go over and add a keyboard sensor for reference. Now what a sensor is it should be pretty self-explanatory. It's what the engine uses to sense input be it from the player or the game itself. But let's dig a little deeper. Firstly, you'll realize that the sensor seems to be split into three sections. The header, the sensor common options, and the body. Both sensors and actuators have exactly the same type of header, and the options inside of it have pretty obvious functions, like how the small arrow minimizes the sensor and vice versa, and the button right next to it can be used to change the sensor type, and then next to that is the name of the sensor, and it's generally a really good idea to go through and name all your sensors, even though it can be kind of tedious, as it makes it a lot easier to keep up with what all is going on in a complex project, and it is absolutely necessary when scripting. Then we have the pin button, which when activated makes the sensor visible even when you hide all the sensors. And next is a checkbox. This determines if the sensor will be active when you play the game. If it's checked, the sensor works. If it's not, then the sensor doesn't work. And finally, we have the big X button. This should definitely be self-explanatory. It deletes the sensor. And now with all that covered, let's move on to the sensor common options. This section only exists in sensors, and what its options do is a little less obvious. The first thing you'll see is two buttons tucked together. These buttons make the sensor pulse either true or false after a certain number of frames as set by the frequency. So as an example of how this works, Let's say you had the sensor set the trigger when you press the space bar, and you had the frequency set to zero. Then it would pulse every frame you held down the space bar, and would pulse 60 times a second. If you had the frequency set to one, then it would pulse every other frame at a rate of 30 times per second. And a frequency of two would skip two frames before it pulsed, and would pulse 20 times a second, and so on and so forth. Now this is particularly useful when working with scripts and setting the frequency higher for certain scripts can really help optimize your game. Then after all that there's the level option and what it does is when you change the logic state it sends either a true or false pulse depending on if the sensor is currently triggered or not. Now if you have no idea what I mean when I say change the logic state, don't worry I'll go over that here in just a bit. Anyway, next up is the tap option. This makes it to where the sensor is only true for the frame it's initially triggered, and after that, it sets back to being false. So yeah, tap is pretty simple, and I'll be showing an example of how it can be useful at the end of the tutorial. And finally, we have the invert option, and all it does is invert the sensor's trigger. Like if you initially had the sensor set the trigger when the space bar is pressed, then when you turn on inversion, it would make the sensor be triggered whenever the space bar isn't held. And now we're finally at the last section of the sensor, the body. And sadly, I can't really go too in-depth on this part, as the body is completely different for each type of sensor, and going over each one would take way too long, and some sensors could have videos all to themselves, so I'll just keep this part short. The body is where you define what the trigger is for the sensor. Okay, so since we've covered everything there is to cover about sensors, let's go ahead and move on to controllers. So let's just go up here, Add an AND controller, and let's get into it. What a controller does is take input from sensors, attach to it, and then interpret that input and use it either to activate actuators that are attached to it, or run a Python script, depending on what type of controller it's using, of which there are a lot. Starting with the default controller type, AND. This controller will only activate its actuators once every one of its sensors is positive. Then we have the OR controller. This one will activate its actuators once any of its sensors are positive, even if it's not all of them. Next up is XOR, and it will activate its controllers when only one of its sensors is positive. If there are more than one positive, then it won't activate its actuators. 
Now the next three controllers are actually the inverse of the first three, starting with NAND. It will keep its actuators active until all of its sensors are positive, at which point it will deactivate all of the actuators. Then there's NOR, which will only activate its actuators while none of its sensors are positive. And the final standard controller type is XNOR. It activates its actuators when either none of its sensors are positive or multiple are positive. If only one is positive, it won't activate its actuators. And that's the last of the standard controllers, meaning we only have two left. The expression and the Python controllers. The expression controller effectively lets you create a custom controller by letting you define when it activates its actuators with a simple Python expression. And the Python controller lets you run a Python script, either as a script or as a module. And now that I've talked about all the types of controllers, let's move on to the options contained in the controller. And you've undoubtedly noticed that most of these are the same as what was in the sensor header, with only two options being different. First, let's talk about the folder icon. What it does is give the controller priority and allows it to run and complete before scripts that don't have priority. The other unique option, right next to it, allows you to pick the logic state of the controller. And there I go talking about the logic state again. Even though I haven't actually covered it yet. So let's get on that. First, look over next to the controller bar and you'll see a little plus button. If you click it, you'll see the logic state menu. This should probably look kind of familiar, as it looks just like the scene layers in the 3D view. And effectively, that's what logic states are. Each state is just another layer of new logic for the object. To better illustrate how this works, and how it may be useful, let's say you had a regular character, and you wanted this character to be able to transform or use a different weapon. Well, you can have the logic state for the character's base form be in logic state 1, while the character's transformation is in a different state. Then you can just switch between them whenever you need one or the other. This helps keep your logic simple and clean, as well as help you keep things organized. When it comes to the logic state menu itself, it's pretty easy to understand. The top part is the current visible logic states, and then the all button right next to it just makes all the states visible. The bottom part is where we will pick what states the game object spawns in using, and the button next to that makes the current logic state of the object show up in debug. And that's pretty much all there is to say about controllers. Okay, so now here we are at the very last type of logic brick. Let's go over here, add a motion actuator for reference, and jump right into it. Actuators are logic bricks that actually do things, like moving the object, changing the value of game properties, the mesh of the object, and so on. Beyond that, there really isn't much else to say about actuators, as its header is, as said, the same as the sensor's header. And also, just like sensors, there's too many individual types of actuators, some of which could also have videos all their own. So yeah, I know it was super short, but I'm just going to go ahead and move on to the next part. So the last part of the logic editor is game properties. And if you go over here and get this little plus button, and you click it, you'll see the properties menu pop up. Just go ahead and add a property for reference and I'll go over it. Game properties are just variables contained within a game object. They can be used as triggers for sensors, modified by actuators, and also be used within Python scripts. There are five types of game properties, starting with boolean, which is a simple true or false variable. This is the most lightweight property and is great for anything with only two modes. The second type of property is a string, which is just a text variable. Then there's integer, which is any whole number between 10,000 and negative 10,000. And then there's float, which has the same range as integers, but can also have decimal points. And finally we have the timer property. It's just a value that counts upward from the originally set value from the moment the game object spawns in. This is useful for things like keeping track of how long it takes someone to complete a level or defeat a boss. And I think I'll end going over game properties there, as all their options are the same as what we've already gone over in Logic Bricks. Okay, so I've gone over everything there is to go over with the Logic Editor, so I'm going to pull this down a little bit, and we're going to get into the example. So the first thing you always want to do is switch it to Blender Game, and we're going to move our cube up a little bit, because that's going to be where we put all of our logic in. I'm going to add a plane, just scale it up a little bit, Pull this little menu out, and I'm going to make the plane be a character physics type. Now the cool thing about character physics type is it lets you use character motion with the motion logic bricks. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that over. 
and zoom out a little bit. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name this W and make it work with the W button and connect all of these. And what we're going to do with this character is we're going to make him be able to move forward and backward, turn left and right, and jump. So I'm going to name this Move Forward. I'm going to make him move forward at about 0 .08, 0 0.08 units. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit up here just so we can see a little, little bit. And yeah, that works. Turn around a little bit so he's actually moving in the right direction. Yeah. Now since we need him to move forward, backward, left, and right, I'm going to go ahead and add three more keyboard sensors. Three more motion sensors. Connect all of those. And if you see, whenever I pull a cord straight across, it always adds a AND controller. Name this S. Just have S in the thing. And name this move back. And we'll move back like negative 0.05 because you're going to move back slower than you're going to move forward. Let's close all of that. And then we're going to name this A. We're going to have it use the A button. And we're going to name this turn left. So over here on our Z axis, we're going to make the character turn about 1.5. Degrees that might that might be fast enough. Yeah, there we go. That's plenty fast enough. Okay, close all that, and then we're gonna name this D. Have it work with the D button. Close all that. Have this be turn right. And on our Z axis, we're gonna have him turn negative 1.5 degrees because he's turning in the opposite direction. And yeah, that works pretty well. So, let's say that you had someone who isn't familiar with WASD and they wanted to try to use the arrow keys. Well, the way we currently have it set up, they couldn't do that. But, we can make it to where they can do that. Let's go ahead and add four more keyboard sensors. What we're going to do is we're going to move them up right below the one we want them to mimic. So, we'll name this one Up Key. Have it be Up. close it, and connect it to this. Now the thing is we need to change this controller from an AND to an OR. Now if the player presses either W or UP, they will immediately move forward with either one, or if they hold both for some reason. Move that down, connect it there, change this to OR, and just repeat this with all of them. Okay, and now that we've done that, if we pull this down and play the game, you'll be able to use either one you want for moving around. Or even both, if you want to do that for some reason. But there's one more thing we need to do, and that's jump. So let's go ahead and add another keyboard sensor, and make this one spacebar. And then add another motion, and this time we'll use a jump. So just click the jump button. Now, if we play the game, the character will jump. But, the character will keep jumping every time he hits the ground for as long as the player holds down the space bar. And, most of the time you don't want this. So what you can do, is get out of that, pull this back up and hit tap. And now if we play the game, the character will jump once every time they hit the space bar. And that's about it for my little example. Hope this was educational and that it showed you how to use the logic editor a little bit better. My next tutorial will be in Python. So yeah, stick around for that. And until next time, see ya.